had made up my mind very strongly. The only thing, being in the Netherlands, uh, it makes me sometimes so angry to see how by parts of the society actually people are denied uh, the journey that I've been taking and that has given me so much fulfillment. And to see people being told that that is not possible, it makes me very angry. If I was satisfied and happy and um, had a sense of peace, then I wouldn't be on this journey. I grew up a very lonely child and just didn't really have any connection with my parents at all. Family is disintegrating at a rapid rate, so there's no communication there. Uh, it seems from some definitions that anyone who shares a fridge is family, but that of course doesn't make for good communication. One of the main issues is the question of uh, therapy to help people who suffer from same-sex attraction that they don't wish to have. Uh, they would like to be rid of it, they go to a therapist and they are refused because that therapist is in danger of being struck off by their professional body. There's very strong pressure on academics and journalists not to explore sexual politics in a critical way or even a detached or disinterested way. And the reason is because it's career suicide. I use the term sexual politics to describe the rise of feminist politics and more recently uh, homosexualist politics. And it's very striking uh, that in the last uh, 40 years or so, uh, the elephant in the room in, in the Western world has been this rise of, of uh, sexual politics. Schon ist es sehr, sehr schwierig, über unsere Arbeit offen zu sprechen. Wir werden immer seltener eingeladen zu ähm, offiziellen oder öffentlichen Veranstaltungen, weil die Veranstalter häufig fürchten, dass es dann in den Medien eine große Schlacht gegen diese Veranstaltung gibt, wie es in der Vergangenheit auch oft schon passiert ist. Das heißt, dann gibt es Proteste, Poli Politiker, die protestieren, ähm, homosexuellen Verbände, die protestieren und viele Veranstalter, egal ob es wissenschaftliche Kongresse sind oder ähm, christliche Veranstaltungen sind, möchten nicht in den Medien dargestellt werden als ähm, ja, ein Homo-Heiler-Kongress oder wie das dann genannt wird, sondern ähm, wollen natürlich den Fokus weiterhin auf ihre gute Arbeit gerichtet haben, auch in der Öffentlichkeit. Und deshalb werden wir überhaupt gar nicht mehr eingeladen. Und wir, werden, wir erfahren tatsächlich auch viel, viel, viel Anfeindung von Hassmails natürlich über Bedrohungen, über Demonstrationen gegen uns und so weiter. Another committee from the UN, who's had input by a lot of American gay organizations, gay activist organizations, has brought about a new statement saying that men who have sex with men have essential rights, which includes 10-year-old boys to have sex with men. So the world through the UN is beginning its slow march towards pedophilia. And my question is to America and the world, are we going to let this same thing throughout history occur in the modern age. Rome, ancient Rome, comes to mind. Are we really going to let pederasty or some form of that exist in the world today? Because that's where some of our professional committees and organizations are trying to make us move towards. I think that modern people undervurderer mangfoldigheten i seksuallivet i antikken. Det er jo utrolig for eksempel hvor mange begreper man kan ha for seksuell aktivitet i både gresk og for så vidt latin. Og, og at en kunne tenke at en storby som Korint eller Roma kan ha mye til felles med moderne storbyer. Understanding the rise of sexual politics in western culture is helped by tracing ideas about sexuality that the ancient Romans, for example, might have understood. My name is Mike Davidson, and I'm exploring the towns at the foot of Mount Vesuvius in Italy, destroyed when it erupted in the first century AD. When Vesuvius erupted in AD 79, Pliny the Younger described the great eruption 
as being like an umbrella pine. But after the eruption, when the dust had settled, what was in the mind of the ancients? And life began to return to normal and the darkened sky once again became bright. The earliest account we have of the eruption comes from a Jewish man recorded in the fourth book of the Sibylline Oracles. He links this event to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, nine years earlier, and to the sacking of the Temple of God. Jewish and Christian believers made a link between this event and what had been such a powerful event in their own histories nine years earlier. I think these issues have relevance for the Church of Christ. If we go back a few hundred years, the famous astronomer Galileo had an argument with the Church. The Church said that the uh, sun revolved around the earth and Galileo said, no, it's the other way around. Uh, people think it's the same thing again with the Church on the defensive, but it's actually a question of role reversal here because it's the scientific establishment is on the defensive. We are raising the evidence and they are backing off with ideology. Uh, and it is important for the church to realize this, to, have, to take courage, to stand up, to inform itself and to fight to maintain our Judeo-Christian values. These issues aren't just for church people. Uh, you don't have to have a faith to perhaps be touched by questions of same-sex attraction. Uh, all of us are the same in that regard. And uh, everybody stands to benefit from good science being done. And uh, it's important that we should take a stand and ensure that science is properly carried out. The Romans, of course, uh, persecuted um, the Christians for 300 years and more. The Roman Empire was one of the few civilizations in history uh, that had cruelty for pleasure. And many Christians, of course, met their deaths uh, in the arena, uh, not just being executed for whatever crimes they were accused of, but for the pleasure of the circus, uh, of the elite as well as the plebeians. Um, Christianity changed Europe completely. I mean, what we see now is the result of the Christian faith. Even Roman law, uh, which became important later on in the history of Europe, was actually Christianized Roman law of Justinian and Theodosius, and not the pagan Roman law under which the Christians suffered. So what we see around us, our view of human rights, of the value of the human person, all of this we owe uh, to the arrival of Christianity. When I see the Colosseum, I can't help but connect it with the Jewish people who helped to build it, whose temple had been sacked following the long Roman occupation under Emperor Vespasian. I think one of the most moving stories of those who have been silenced has to be the account of the sacking of the temple and the bringing back of the plundered goods that were then used to build the Colosseum. Titus's arch in front of me was the place through which Titus marched with the slaves from Jerusalem, marking his triumph and his great victory in Jerusalem. Josephus tells us that 97,000 slaves were taken from Jerusalem at the time of the ending of the temple. He also records that 11,000 people perished in that event when Titus destroyed the temple and sacked Jerusalem. We cannot forget when we look at the Colosseum how this has come about and why it's happened in the way that it has. It seems to me that this is a story and a dimension of this building that has been obscured and lost. I became a Christian when I was about 18 and my mother was a Jewess and my father was a Christian, went to the Church of England. And to start with, these two worlds were separate. And then as I grew as a Christian, I, be, I did come to realize and see that um, Christianity was actually the, the fruit, the fulfillment, continuation of Judaism, because the Jewish prophets 
what they spoke about in the Old Testament was actually fulfilled by Jesus. And of course, all the apostles were, um, were Jews. And um, so for me, it brought together these two parts of my life and made them into one. Through maturing and growing, I just saw this was an amazing fulfillment. And um, I still have a lot of family in Israel because my mum came from Israel. And I'm able in visiting them to you know, share with them from the Old Testament. Of the, you know, so much about the Lord Jesus uh, is very plain in the Old Testament without even going to the New Testament. And I also think that um, you know, the church can miss out tremendously uh, when forgetting about its Jewish roots. The Jewish people turned out to be countercultural. In Europe today, the church particularly has to think about that, uh, how to relate positively to culture where it can do so, but where it can't, uh, how uh, to resist uh, capitulation uh, to culture, which can, of course, be very strongly demanded. The Arch of Titus is really important because of the two panels that represent the history that it is reflecting on. The more famous and best known of the panels is the one behind me. It marks the start of the procession led by Titus. It shows those who are in the procession carrying the booty that was taken from the temple. The table of showbread, the silver trumpets, more importantly, the menorah, reflecting the light and the glory of Israel. One of the most poignant and sad stories is remembering what happened in 1948 when the Jewish state of Israel was declared. And the story has it that Jews that had survived banishment to Auschwitz congregated in this area. The Talmud had taught them never to walk through or under the Arch of Titus because of all that it evoked in terms of the sacking of Jerusalem and the plundering of the temple. In May 1948, when Israel was declared a state, the Jews who were living in Rome gathered here and marched in that direction, out of the Forum reversing all the fortunes that had come upon them when Titus had brought them and carried the menorah into captivity. And probably one of the most moving things to talk about is the fact that this menorah becomes the symbol of the State of Israel. This is not really an instrument to bring light in the temple. It's really a statement about the light that comes from the nation of Israel to the people of the earth. I think it's a remarkable story. And again, it's a story that's in danger of being lost. I've come to Warsaw, to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. The particular event that I'm interested in is the Human Dimensions Implementation Meeting in which 57 nations sit round a table and examine whether or not their human rights responsibilities have been successful in terms of their home countries. I've been thinking about how some people, and particularly people of faith, are being represented in Western Europe today. Why is it that some people and some events are removed from the historical narrative that is so important in our culture today. What are the conditions under which this happens? This is part of uh, an important question, I think, for people of faith who, it seems to me, are being airbrushed or are being presented or represented in a way that they don't own and don't want. Traditionally in Western society, there have been three main centers of opposition. One is the journalism, one is the church, and the third is the academic world. In other words, it is in these sectors of society that we expect to hear critics of government policy. So it is especially serious when these three areas are silent, when the prophets, the intellectuals, uh, refuse to be heard. And that's precisely what is happening today as a result of the sexual agenda. I will now pass on the floor 
to the core issues trust to be followed by uh, the United States of America. Chairman and members of the OSCE, thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. My concern is how evidence, rights, freedoms and conscience are trampled through viewpoint discrimination under the UK's aggressive secular state. Our requests are the following. We request the OSCE to note the rising intolerance of liberal orthodoxy among politicians in an increasingly intolerant UK state. Secondly, the uncensured propagation of hate speech terms such as bigot to denounce unpopular viewpoints about therapy for unwanted same-sex attractions. The UK would like to respond in relation to the issues raised by the representative of the Core Issues Trust. The UK government is committed to the safeguarding uh, freedom of religion, of free speech and defending the valuable role of faith in public life. We fully support people's right to conduct their lives in accordance with their faith insofar as this does not unlawfully interfere with the rights of others. However, it is important to strike a fair balance between religious freedom of expression and the rights of, for example, lesbian, gay and bisexual people not to be discriminated against. The UK government believes the Equality Act of 2010 strikes the right balance between the rights of people to manifest their religion or belief and the rights of others not to be discriminated against or, or harassed due to their protected characteristics such as sexual orientation. We are confident the balance struck in the Equality Act is the correct one and we have no plans therefore to change the law. It seems to me that there is one agenda being protected in their response and the need to accommodate diversities that don't favour the new state orthodoxy that celebrates homosexuality is not being heard. I spoke to Barrister Paul Diamond, a human rights lawyer from London, the same day. Paul is standing counsel for the Christian Legal Centre. In my view, Christians are being silenced in the public sphere. They're actually being silenced from our opponent's point of view for a very good reason, that Judeo-Christian values work, Christianity works, and it produced for example, in the United Kingdom, parliamentary democracy, tolerance and freedom all, and human rights, all the things our opponents claim we didn't give and they will give. Um, and I think we can see the fallaciousness of that argument. Secularism is also a worldview uh, and its presuppositions need to be examined and sometimes challenged. But having said that, if the nation uh, wants uh, one of these new realities that you're talking about uh, to be acknowledged, then it must also acknowledge that other people may have a different view and to accommodate them, to respect uh, properly formed consciences. Uh, that is very important, I think, um, if a free society is going to be maintained and to flourish. The idea of reasonable accommodation is that people's beliefs must be respected at the workplace. Again, not just for Christians, but for wide sections of the community, reasonable accommodation of belief and the manifestation of belief at the workplace, but also, of course, in other areas, uh, for example, in volunteering um, or in running um, voluntary agencies. Uh, that is where reasonable accommodation needs to be made. A very good example happened in 2013 when I was testifying in the State Senate uh, of New Jersey. They were considering a, a bill that would have banned sexual orientation change effort therapy for minors. And I testified having been someone that came out of homosexuality myself and helping a number of individuals also transition out of homosexuality. And after I testified, uh, uh, a man who was transitioning into a woman, a transgender, activist Briel Godani uh, spoke about being sent to a, a conversion therapy torture camp as as she called it at the time called True Directions. She said they had used electroshock and electroconvulsive and also um, different types of aversion therapeutic methods. I went and researched um, the details of this experience of, of Briel Godani. I actually interviewed her um, for about an hour. Uh, she took my phone call and got the details. Well, I was genuinely concerned that if this kind of activity was indeed happening that I would be someone that would be on the front lines trying to shut it down. I mean, 
But what we found out was, was um, that there wasn't a shred of truth involved in this camp at all. In fact, True Directions was, um, never existed, the camp True Directions. What it did exist was a 1997 movie starring drag queen RuPaul, which is a satire on um, sexual orientation change effort therapy. And in that satire movie, the camp was called True Directions. And in this satire, parents sent their gay or LGBT identified children to this fictitious camp called True Directions to, quote, turn them from gay to straight. Well, we now know that that, that whole story that Brielle Goldani told was lifted from this 1999 movie starring drag queen RuPaul. I called the Ohio Secretary of State and Attorney General's office, and in fact, no such camp called True Directions ever existed. I even spoke to the church in New Jersey that Brielle Goldani said sponsored her to go to this camp, and they said it was a ridiculous notion for them to ever uh, agree to or support any such endeavor. We exposed this story uh, as, as lies. We, we called reporters, we said, you know, this story has been, has been entered into evidence, into testimony, and this is affecting children's lives in New Jersey. And they wouldn't touch it, they wouldn't expose it, they completely shut us down, wouldn't allow our voices to be heard. And tragically, that bill got through the legislature and was signed by the governor in August of 2013. The main issues that we took up were this business of our, what is the evidence that people are born with their sexual orientation? And what is the evidence that they cannot change? These seem to me to be entirely fair and appropriate questions. We address them to the president of the Royal College. She never replied to us. After two months, we had a letter saying we will not discuss these things. Now, I think that's gross. It's rude on any level, <laughs> but in terms of their medical responsibilities, it's gross. We asked proper, well-researched and detailed questions about the science and they won't discuss it. The Royal College of Psychiatrists have misled both church and state. They made a submission to the Church of England which had five broad themes. You're born gay because it's biological. You can't change. If you try to change, you'll harm yourself. If you find it uh, that you're depressed or suicidal, you are probably suffering from homophobia in society. Uh, and likewise, if you find it hard to hold a same-sex relationship together, it's probably society's fault. Now, all five of those are unsupported by science. Uh, the Royal College itself undermined the first two of these. Uh, the following year, they brought out a new position statement which said, not it's biological causation, but it's a combination of biology and early life experiences. And they use the crucial word, postnatal and what happens to you postnatally means you were not born that way and that message needs to go out around the world you were not born that way uh, similarly they acknowledge that there is a fluidity in sexuality so that it can change they don't accept that it can be changed but it can change so that undermines the second point the third point they sustained by misquoting or misrepresenting a scientific paper by changing the word majority to read small minority uh, and the fourth and fifth points were rebutted by the Church of England working group itself to whom they made the submission uh, who said look if you look at the studies that you are referring to they don't actually support that the points that you're making so all five of these points are invalidated. Science in many respects has been hijacked and um, I don't think you can, should base a civil rights movement on f uh, the suppression of certain data. Why is there such criticism against you and reparative therapy? Because the greatest threat to the gay agenda is when one man stands up and says, I was once homosexual and I'm no longer homosexual. That's a major threat to the gay agenda. Why? Because fundamental to the gay agenda is you're born gay. A very good example of the, of the politicization of this subject is in 2009 the American Psychological Association 
wanted to release a study, an extensive study on the subject of homosexuality. And we submitted our names, those of us in North, myself, Yarhouse, Stanton Jones, Dean Bird. These are all big names who have submitted, have done research in this area. We submitted our names. We were all rejected. Uh, the principle of client autonomy has always been very important. Uh, and if we imagine a spectrum, what's happening now is that all the major mental health institutions have moved from the client end of the spectrum to the therapist end, where the therapist will direct the goals. The issues that have failed to reflect scientific rigor, I think, can be summarized in the consensus document that the mental health organizations have together produced, which asks itself three questions. Uh, first, what is conversion therapy? Part of the answer, we believe, note that phrase, it has the potential to cause harm. Why do therapy professionals consider it unethical? We believe it would be irresponsible and potentially damaging. What does research tell us about conversion therapy? We believe that it would be likely to reinforce the notion that these feelings are wrong or abnormal. These answers are not scientific answers. They are, they are ideological. Science has been replaced by ideology. The American Psychological Association is very much governed by special interest groups and that dominates the, the, the policy making. The policy is not based in science. The policy is based on politics. So according to these opinions on both sides of the Atlantic, there is a political or unchallenged ideological perspective that distorts scientific inquiry and has in fact completely omitted important evidence to support the opposite point of view. It seems to me that what you're saying has to do with the nature of the evidence that is either being presented or not being presented. It does. So, for instance, the Royal College of Psychiatrists completely overlooked the evidence of twin studies as to whether people are born gay. It completely overlooked the evidence that people can change. Now the college said in their statement that um, there is no evidence that therapy works. But that itself is a distortion. What they should have said is there's no evidence full stop. We have to ask ourselves whether we are dealing with poor scientific inquiry or more seriously fraudulent research actively designed to arrive at a presupposed ideological and political position. There is a lot of concern in medicine about fraudulent interpretations of science. So much so that a former editor of the British Medical Journal thinks these people should, people who fraudulently report things should be criminalized. The General Medical Council quite properly launched a national campaign to alert doctors to the business of scientific fraud, to encourage whistleblowers to blow the whistle on when they know things are not right. They uh, say that it's fundamental that people can um, uh, be challenged and ask questions and the question should be dealt with properly and rigorously. And they took this roadshow around the country. So it seemed only appropriate that we should draw this particular matter for the Royal College of Psychiatrists to them and, and show them this example and they won't handle it. They're a toothless tiger. Wir reden niemandem etwas ein. Wir informieren über die Möglichkeit eines Zusammenhangs zwischen lebensgeschichtlichen Verletzungen und der Entwicklung einer homosexuellen, bisexuellen oder manchmal auch transgender Orientierung. Jeder muss selber sehen, ob das für ihn in seiner Lebenssituation, wenn er mit solchen Empfindungen ringt, zutrifft oder nicht. In den 20 Jahren, in denen ich mit Menschen geredet habe, ich kann nur über die Menschen reden, die zu mir gekommen sind oder die uns gefragt haben, waren es immer irgendwelche Verletzungen, die zumindest erheblich dazu beigetragen haben, dass 
ungewünschte homosexuelle Empfindungen entstanden sind. Aber das muss jeder für sich selber sehen und schauen. Und da vertraue ich auch, dass jeder das, das selber sieht, was, was für ihn zutrifft und was für ihn nicht zutrifft. Und dass homosexuelle Empfindungen etwas zu tun haben, in vielen Fällen mit Kindheitsverletzungen, mit Bindungsirritationen, das hat die therapeutische Forschung ja seit vielen Jahren, seit Anna Freud und später die Psychoanalytiker herausgefunden. Das ist nicht einfach nur aus der Luft gegriffen. Es gibt auch eine interessante Studie aus Dänemark, wo man alle Standesamtsregisterdaten analysiert hat und verglichen hat, ob man in der Kindheitsgeschichte einen Unterschied findet bei Männern, die verheiratet sind und Männern, die in einer eingetragenen homosexuellen Partnerschaft leben. Und man hat festgestellt, dass deutlich häufiger ähm, Männer, die in einer homosexuellen eingetragenen Partnerschaft leben, als Kind die Scheidung ihrer Eltern erlebt haben, bevor sie sechs Jahre alt waren und damit dann auch ohne Vater aufgewachsen sind. Diese Zusammenhänge mögen nicht für jeden gelten, aber sie sind immer wieder Hinweise, die Leute ermutigen, in ihrer eigenen Lebensgeschichte zu schauen, ob es Zusammenhänge gibt. Und die Leute sind froh und erleichtert, wenn sie Zusammenhänge finden. Die Forschung hat auch gezeigt, dass Homosexualität nicht einfach angeboren ist. One of the main things, of course, my Christian faith and my conversion, that was the biggest change in my whole life. But if I would turn back the clock at the age of 13, 14, when I discovered my homosexual feelings, and I look at education that was given at school, actually not, nothing, non-education whatsoever. The lack of knowledge that I had and no people around me who could tell me something valid about having homosexual feelings or desires for the same sex. That is something that I would love to see different actually looking back where young people get real information and not just the fact, okay, you are born like that. It's in your DNA. First of all, I believe from science that it's, that it's not true at all. But that was the picture that I grew up with. You're born like this, make the best out of it and live happily ever after. And I would love to see that being changed, first of all, because it's not the truth. Non-scientific influences often are very important in shaping uh, the final interpretations and understanding uh, of data from science that is disseminated to the public. When you get right down to it, looking at the community of scientists and the professional organizations, there's very uh, little ideological difference uh, among the members of these communities typically. So socio-politically they share the same point of view. You do not find a lot of diversity in terms of viewpoint. And so um, one of the things that risks is that risks uh, confirmation bias, which is where we tend to value results uh, more highly when they match our uh, particular Uh, moral and political beliefs, uh, and we might tend to more disregard findings and results that don't uh, kind of line up with our values and our socio-political beliefs. With many areas of life, we go in with presuppositions, and all our conclusions are worked out on the basis of fundamental assumptions that we're making. So if you assume that homosexuality is an entirely healthy option, that people are born with their sexual orientation, uh, then you will assume that that is the way it should be. And then anyone who wants to alter sexual desires is trying to do something that is unnatural. Whereas if you approach it with the, with the assumption that the natural order of sexuality is male and female for the uniting of their relationship, but also for the procreation of children, and therefore this is the natural approach, then you're more likely to be sympathetic to people who have homosexual desires 
and want out of it. The research is not occurring that could be coming from a different point of view that might shed light uh, on, um, on the subject matter like sexual orientation change. Uh, we're never going to get to that unless we have people that are able, and researchers and scientists that are able to answer questions and frame uh, the research problem and look at the data and come bring to it different values and morals because that will affect the interpretation oftentimes. So that's why diversity of viewpoint and diversity of uh, uh, ideological uh, understanding, diversity of values is so critical to uh, the practice of science. The evidence that we can show is that change is possible we've been talking about it, but now we can show it in hard numbers that change is possible. Certainly not for everyone. We always say that. Not everyone can change. But on average, people benefit through this kind of therapy in terms of reducing something that they find problematic in their life, namely same-sex attraction, okay? And that it doesn't do harm. We are, it'll, it'll, this, this study will give legitimacy to our claims and it'll encourage other people who are wanting such help to seek such help. And it'll hopefully silence those who are trying to discredit us by putting out this repeated lie that we are harming people. We are under the um, oversight of the Institutional Review Board of the University, where I'm um, a professor and a department chair. And that Institutional Review Board is under the authority of the Department of Health and Human Services that is um, protection of human participants in research. Um, and so we, you know, standard procedure for any kind of human participant research at a university. Uh, and um, so that's that's what we're using. That The guideline, the Department of Human and uh, Health and Human Services has a, a lot of standards for the protection of participants. It's very important for us to have that um, to do this research with that kind of uh, rigor of protection um, because we care about the, the participants, but also because we want to show people that, that um, this is uh, legitimate, legitimate research. It's clear the differences on the issue of providing support for those wanting to move away from homosexuality seem intractable. But the efforts to discuss both the available evidence and the framing of the debate will continue. And work continues in three areas. Firstly, the inquiry into how best to help those with unwanted homosexual feelings. Secondly, monitoring and where possible intervening in the political institutions that derive the world's political agendas, such as the United Nations and the OSCE. And finally, challenging misleading assumptions both in and outside of the church. One of the misleading assumptions cultivated by activists and revisionists wanting to modernize Christian teaching on sexuality is that loving homosexual relationships were unknown among the ancients. They claim, for example, that the Apostle Paul's opposition to homosexual practices was because he didn't understand that homosexuality is an inborn, natural orientation. But scholars like Hubbard, for example, refute this. Many of the ancients question sexual behaviors of the day. After the Colosseum was completed by slave builders in Rome, Jewish slaves, mindful of Jewish or Christian teachings on sexual purity, may well have found themselves disseminated into towns like Pompeii, and Herculaneum in southern Italy, at the foot of Mount Vesuvius. When the Gospel of Christ came, with its Judeo-Christian values, it challenged the pansexual values of the Greco-Roman world then, just as it continues to do today. Homosexual practices had been unknown in ancient Israel, the home of the slaves, and there's no record of homosexuality taking root in that society. Such practices, however, were common in Europe. What did the slaves make of it? Over the years, archaeologists have found many places in Pompeii reputed to be brothels, usually thought so because of erotic 
frescoes or murals that are placed on the walls. But the building behind me, the central Lupinar, is probably the best example of a dedicated site that is known to have been a brothel. It contains not only seven erotic paintings above the five cells or rooms where people would consort with prostitutes. There are also stone masonry beds, and those are two of the characteristics that archaeologists now require before they categorize something as a brothel. Upstairs, there were five rooms also, probably living quarters for those who worked downstairs, all of whom would have been slaves. And there would have been one large room upstairs also that was a kind of common room. Sexual desires affect everyone. And we all, reluctant as we often are, have to control our desires and channel them in certain directions. Sexual anarchy in society is frightening. Um, the illegitimacy, the disease, the lack of relationship, the is social isolation of people. Um, if they're not locked into a caring, loving community that's cemented by the one flesh relationship, which is so fundamental in Christian understanding of society, um, there, then there is mayhem. So we have to control our desires and we have to focus them. And the question is how we focus them, where we focus them. Um, but we're not a slave to our desires. This is a great myth that we have to fulfill every inkling and it leads to anarchy. We're in the famous Lupinarium in Pompeii. This is the place where men would come to have sex, usually with slaves under the control of very controlling uh, slave owners. In his book, Roman Homosexuality, Ideologies of Masculinity in Classical Antiquity, Craig Williams makes some very astute observations. He points out that the average married male Roman could have sex with his slaves and not risk criticism from his peers. This is a time that adultery was frowned on more than pederasty. And interestingly, he points out that if a man's masculinity was impugned by his neighbor, what he could do is cite the fact that he had had sexual relations with his accuser's sons as a way of countering this accusation. Interesting also, men who were known to be womanizers could be thought of as effeminate or soft. So what we see here is a completely different ideology of sexuality and particularly of masculinity. The fact that you could be an adulterer and yet also engaged in homosexual activity points to the fact that this was more of a pansexual society and had a completely different understanding of the way uh, men and women should behave. I think it also points to the fact that we are trained and we come to take on board the sexual mores of the culture and the society that we live in. This is surely evidence of the huge environmental contribution towards our understanding of sexuality. One of the reasons for coming to Pompeii is to try to begin to understand the difference between the ancient ideologies and the modern ideologies that teach us about the differences between concepts of sexuality in ancient and modern times. I think this is very important because it helps us to understand the environmental and cultural input to sexuality that all of us experience, that we imbibe almost by osmosis because of the cultures and the societies that we grow up in. And it teaches us that ideologies 
come and they go, and it's the culture that brings that about. Now we know that the brain itself isn't fully developed until you're well into your 20s, mid-20s. This has enormous implications for adolescence. If adolescence carries on that long, you, what you experience in adolescence, you're laying down neurological responses, pathways of desire, which can be molded and shaped by your activities. So you're reinforcing in your adolescence, you're laying down and reinforcing uh, what are going to be the instinctive responses that you will enjoy in later life. So we have to allow for people to um, not set down pathways. And we see this in all sorts of other areas, such as pornography. If you constantly reinforcing those pathways, it's very difficult to throw off. Similarly, promiscuity becomes very difficult to throw off. Later in life, adulterous desires uh, become laid down. If you've wrestled with these things in your adolescence or your early adult life, they probably will be recurring throughout life and have to be dealt with. You've got to face them. The battle goes on. Yeah, everyone is affected by this. We have to learn to control our sexual desire. Amikor az a kritika ér, hogy ráerőltetek valakire valamilyen világnézetet, azzal nehezen tudok mit kezdeni, hiszen nagyon sok féle megközelítése van a témának, és azt hiszem, hogy nekem el kell fogadni, hogy más más hogy látja. Én nekem azoknak kell segíteni, akik azzal keresnek meg, hogy ők nem érzik jól magukat homoszexuálisként, és ők szeretnének változtatni. És az a fajta segítség, amiben én tudom őket kísérni, az akkor működik, hogyha mi hasonlóképpen látjuk ezt a kérdést. Ha valaki máshogy látja, én azt hiszem, hogy ez az ő szabadsága, hogy máshogy látja. Nem akarok senkire ráerőltetni semmit. Amikor valaki a homoszexualitás kérdésével keres meg, és ebben kér segítséget, én, mint lelkipásztor, lelki gondozó, nem a témát vagy az ügyet látom, hanem az embert, akinek ez egy egzisztenciális nehéz kérdés. És Ilyenkor én azt tartom fontosnak és hitelesnek, hogy emberként tudjak ebben mellé állni, és keresni vele azokat a válaszokat, amikre ő, vagy keresni azokra a kérdésekre a válaszokat, amivel ő megkeresett. Ilyen emberek is, akik a homoszexualitással küzdenek, megfordulnak a programjainkon is, ezért is találtuk nagyon fontosnak azt, ha ez a korai kötődés nem jön létre, itt sebek keletkeznek, fájdalmak vannak, ezeket gyógyítani kell. Most legutóbb is szerveztünk egy szakmai napot, egy képzést szakembereknek is, meg érintett résztvevőknek is, hogy hogy lehet a kötődésben szerzett sebet helyreállítani, meggyógyítani. Szeretnénk a szakemberek figyelmét is ráirányítani arra, hogy ez egy nagyon fontos kérdés, hogy a születéskor a háborítatlan szülés megvalósulhasson. Tíz évig foglalkoztam egyetemistákkal egyetemi misszióban. Most lelki gondozók képzésében veszek részt, és amit tapasztaltam, hogy nagyon sok fiatal keres meg azokkal a témákkal, ami ma Európában, Magyarországon egy fiatalnak témája. Család, alapítás, pályaválasztás, szexualitás. Amikor azzal keresnek meg, hogy homoszexuális érzéseik vannak, de ebben nem érzik jól magukat, akkor én mindig azt látom, hogy az egyre inkább az a tapasztalatom, hogy hogy olyan állapotban találnak meg, amikor már csak erre a témára fókuszálnak. És abban kell őket segíteni, hogy a saját szexuális fejlődésüket is, mint folyamatként kezdjék el látni, és a saját személyiségüknek és a fejlődésüknek, a kapcsolódásaiknak a, a viszonyában látni ezt az egész kérdést. Anecdotal evidence may not be the stuff of public policy making, but it has certainly been influential 
in raising the profile of the LGBTI agenda across the world. There's another voice, however, perhaps hesitant, less well promoted, often marginalized and ignored, and sometimes hated. This group of individuals from countries across Western Europe, often in their home language, share their stories and the truths that are important to their happiness and well-being. They share them not to offer a new dogma, but because they have found pathways that have been difficult to discover and perhaps even hidden from them. They deserve to be celebrated and encouraged in their willingness to stand up for their own truths. Those who cannot show their faces remind us that speaking out comes with a price in our modern societies. Körülbelül öt évvel az előtt úgy döntöttem, hogy nem szeretnék már homoszexuálisként élni. És ennek részben az az oka, hogy, a, hogy egy ismerősöm megkeresett, és azt mondta, hogy van lehetőség a változása. Másrészt pedig én akkor már egy zsákutcának a végén álltam. A zsákutca az alatt én azt értem, hogy túl voltam akkor már öt kapcsolatom. Egymás után öt művel volt kapcsolatom, és nem azt a, hogy is mondjam, eredményt adta, vagy nem, nem azt nyújtotta, amit én vártam tőle. Édesapámmal való kapcsolatom eléggé sebzett volt, sérült volt. Sok éven keresztül úgy tekintettem rá, mint egy ellenségre. Nos, véletlenül ebből a rossz kapcsolatból alakulhatott az ki, hogy bennem fölépült egy fal a férfi kapcsolatokban, tehát a férfiakkal való kapcsolataimban. Tulajdonképpen mindig volt egy ilyen félelem, egy félelem bennem, hogy ők mit gondolnak rólam. Tehát arra a kérdése, hogy ez nehéz volt-e segítséget kapni, támogatást kapni, azt mondhatom, hogy én nagyon szerencsés voltam, mert valakit fölkerestem, és az a valaki ismert Németországban egy közös, közösséget, illetve egy intézetet, akik tudtak nekem segíteni illetve azután találtak nekem olyan terapeutát, aki nyitott volt arra, hogy mik az én céljaim, ezt tiszteletben tartotta, és ennek megfelelően támogatott engem. A nőkkel való kapcsolatomban is nagyon sok minden megváltozott. Az is egy fontos dolog, hogy volt bennem egy elég jelentős kisebb rendőségi érzés, és ezt nyilvánvalóan nőkkel szemben éreztem. Ez, ez nagyon nagyban csökkent. My name is Alia, I am from the Netherlands and I'm in my early 30s. My name is Lindsay Greaves. Um, I've been married to John for 26 years and uh, we have five children. I was growing up as the eldest in a big family. And around like the age of 14, 15, I just realized that I didn't really feel like attracted to guys as a, as a lot of my friends were. And I just came more and more to the realization that I felt attracted to women and to girls. I grew up in the north of England in a what seemingly looked like an ordinary family. Um, my parents were quite disconnected from each other and also from me. So I grew up a very lonely child and just didn't really have any connection with my parents at all, apart from being fed and clothed. They looked after me in that kind of way. And so my life was outside of the family. Um, one of my earliest memories is trying to get adopted by another family. And um, I had a very uh, la a sense of a lack of belonging, really. I began to feel very overly connected with certain girls and as my teenage years progressed that got more intense. And so when I was around the age of 19, 20 I just finally opened up to a very good friend of mine and um, we became very close very soon in our friendships and we friendship and we really opened up to one another and at some point like 
we, we started to become very like dependent on one another emotionally. And after those one and a half years, we broke up. I had become quite a worldling in my teenage years. I used to drink a lot and go to a lot of parties. So this was a whole new world. And I was very aware that this same-sex attraction that I'd had was actually getting worse, not better, when I became a Christian. So I got in touch with this pastor and I started to really like, push, like kind of like figuring out who God really was. I had thought that all that would kind of go away, but it didn't. It actually got worse because of the deeper connections that I was making with people, particularly women. And at that point, I got involved in a, in a full-blown relationship with somebody for a couple of years um, within the context of the church, strangely. Um, at the time, I didn't think that it was wrong. Um, it felt right. And uh, I sort of led a double life in a way, and so did she. Um, but after about two years, I began to feel that it was wrong. And I began to know that God had something more for me than this. So, and I also realized when I was honest towards myself, that there was definitely some hurt, like in my life, in the area of womanhood, in the area of uh, relationships with other women, in the area of relationships with men. And I just started um, yeah, to go through um, inner healing and to go through my traumas and to work on my issues. And just in that whole process I have changed. I came back from abroad and I was in faith to meet somebody. And we met at a party and we had an immediate connection with each other. We both shared a love for the Jewish people and for the Bible and for all things God really and we had an immediate connection with each other. I knew straight away that this was the man that, that God wanted me to marry. And it, it filled me with great joy and I was very excited. And so we, we actually got married within about, uh, within a year of, of knowing each other. I have definitely changed. I've completely changed. Like even in the way how I look, the way how I view life, the way how I relate to other women, the way how I relate to men. And definitely something has grown in the way I see men. Um, but I definitely have every now and then a thought. And I mean, yeah, there are definitely moments that I think, okay, you know, like, oh, I'm triggered a little bit. But I know where it comes from, and I know what the roots are to those triggers, and I also know what to do with it. I got married, but I'd never really dealt with the root reasons, only up to a point. Then about uh, 10 years ago, after we'd been married some time and had five children, uh, we came across a ministry in the church which helped people with this. And at that point, I really began to get to grips with the deep reasons of why I had been so intensely same-sex attracted because it was still there in my life and I knew that it was still a vulnerability and I had a bit of a crisis about 10 years ago on that issue which really propelled me to get to the bottom of it which I did and I received some real help from a particular ministry uh, in this area I wish that I had been able to access that much earlier on and I, have a, and I have a deep heart for people now who are in my situation, who need help. Ich heiße David und ich bin 44 Jahre alt. Ja, also ich hatte äh, von Anfang an eine sehr schwierige Beziehung zu meinen Eltern. Ich habe über die Gefühle meiner Mutter gelebt und hatte es relativ schwer, in Beziehung mit meinem Vater zu treten. Aus dem Grund konnte ich dann auch nicht äh, in der Weise mich öffnen und in, wirklich in Beziehung gehen, wo meine Gefühle, sage ich mal, Raum hatten. Und so war ich auch in der Schule mit Gleichaltrigen, habe ich mich sehr schwer getan und musste dort 
sage ich mal, ja, eigentlich erleben, dass ich nicht dazugehöre, dass ich nicht angenommen bin bei denen. Yes, I'm Ansel Pronk, I'm 44 years now. I married for eight years with Sinomso and we have three children. In der Vergangenheit musste ich meine Gefühle verstecken, mich selbst eigentlich verstecken, weil ich immer den Eindruck hatte, ich gehöre nicht zu den anderen, ich reiche nicht, es ist nicht gut genug, was ich mache und ich kann die anderen in ihren Emotionen, in ihren Gefühlen, in ihrem Wesen gar nicht erreichen, ihnen nicht genügen und gehöre deswegen nicht dazu. My own personal journey started in a family with five children. Uh, went to church, uh, quite orthodox church. Um, my father was working very much, very hard to try to provide for the family, uh, but we didn't see him that much at home. And then when I was about 16 years old, maybe a little bit earlier, 14, 15, uh, I gradually started realizing that, yeah, to me something was wrong because I didn't fall in love with girls as other guys did and I started developing uh, feelings for other guys. Most relationships were very short, only focused on my body, not on me. It was about 16 years ago now. Uh, I went to a conference and that was for the, re for the really first time that I really got an encounter with the Lord. Das, was mich am meisten erreicht hat, wo ich am meisten Lebensmut wieder gefunden habe, das war die Männerreise, die ich mitgemacht habe, wo ich erkannt habe, dass ich ein Mann bin, der einen Wert hat. Und ich habe dort dann erlebt, dass in dem, wo ich das verstanden habe, wo ich das verinnerlicht habe, dass plötzlich meine schweren Depressionen und Selbstmordgedanken weg waren die mich über Jahrzehnte begleitet haben. When I came back from the conference, uh, I, I actually quit my job and I went to uh, do the counseling schools uh, in Utrecht with Utrecht and Mission. And when I did the, particularly the addictive behavior counseling school, I came to realize so many issues that were not right in my life. And as I started dealing with those issues, uh, I found healing in those issues the need for the, the sexual encounters and the pressure to ever go back into that uh, really disappeared. They went down. And it was only years, a couple of years later, it was like some years that I, I really didn't have any desire. Not no strong desires to guys, but I didn't know yet how to fall in love with a girl. It was only some years later, as I started growing more and more and just living out who I really was. And I came also to realize that I'm not just a homosexual, I'm actually a human being where sexuality is just a part of. And as I just started growing in, a, in all the other aspects, a couple of years later, I suddenly got butterflies in my stomach <laughs> towards a woman, and that was in Nigeria. And I've not, not even married that woman, <laughs> but it, as most times with relationship, it doesn't uh, match immediately. But then, about two years later, I got to know my wife and we started a relationship and got married. And for me, finding healing in many aspects of my life and in the end, even receiving a, uh, a healing in my sexuality was just like a big gift. And for me, the biggest crown after my marriage, after receiving my, my wife and getting married, was to receive children. I uh, realized towards the end of my 20s that I uh, had certain compulsive behaviors, patterns in my life, which um, had come to a head and had really started to interfere with my ability to function. Um, and I started to find ways to control or, or find a solution to these problems so that I could have peace and, and live a relatively happy, happy and normal life because those behaviors, uh, including alcohol and um, sec my sexual behavior, were, were preventing me from um, finding any peace or, or from being happy or even being able to function in terms of you know, making a living, supporting myself. Also mein Name ist Marcel, ich bin 29. Ähm, ich bin vom Beruf Sozialarbeiter und ähm, mit dem Thema Homosexualität ähm, bin ich jetzt schon, ähm, oder mit dem Thema Veränderung auch, bin ich jetzt schon unterwegs, seit ich 21 bin, also schon seit acht Jahren jetzt. Ähm, 
und ähm, ja, war auch selber sechs bis sieben Jahre in Begleitung wegen dem äh, Thema Homosexualität und Veränderung. So what is motivating you to um, seek solutions around the conflict that you experience in the area of sexuality? Well, if I was satisfied and happy and um, had a sense of peace, then I wouldn't be on this journey. Ich kam darauf, um, dass ich Hilfe brauche. Um, eigentlich aus mehreren Gründen oder aus zwei Gründen. Ähm, zum einen habe ich mir viele Fragen gestellt, was diese homosexuellen Gefühle ähm, eigentlich sind und ob ich das jetzt ausleben soll. Ähm, hatte mich auch schon ein Stück weit dazu entschieden, das auszuleben. Mhm. Und ähm, dann kam aber ein Prozess, wo, ich, wo es mir sehr schlecht ging. Ähm, und ähm, und das war immer schon so in meinem Leben, dass ich zu anderen Menschen, ähm, auch zu, ich war damals in der Ausbildung, in der Berufsausbildung, ähm, zu Kollegen und anderen Azubis, also zu anderen Auszubildenden, ähm, gar keinen Kontakt hatte und dass ich immer ganz allein war für mich und dass es mir deswegen dann immer schlechter ging und ich dann, ja, es mir sehr schlecht ging, sodass ich auch überlegt habe, mich umzubringen und dann habe ich ähm, eben ähm, von Wüstenstrom erfahren. Ähm, und mich da gemeldet und ähm, so kam ich dann in den Prozess. I've learned that the way that I have behaved in, in my life, in the past more so, perhaps slightly less so now, has been driven by um, self-seeking and uh, a lot of my problems came out of the fact that um, I was very self-centered and I still can be sometimes. Um, I always thought of myself first and I didn't think enough about others. And that, um, I learned that by in, in my um, successful attempts to, to overcome alcohol, addiction to alcohol um, and other things. I found a, a spiritual solution which involves relying on uh, some power greater than myself, which means that I no longer need to reach out. To those destructive behaviors. Ja, ich weiß inzwischen, warum ich diese Gefühle habe. Ich wurde sehr früh, als drei-, vierjähriger, schon von meiner Mutter ähm, körperlich beschämt. Ja, meine Mutter hat mich ähm, körperlich beschämt, ähm, also sozusagen nackt verprügelt von meiner Schwester. Wir haben zwei Frauen eben meinen männlichen Körper beschämt. Ähm, und ähm, auch ähm, durch ihre Aggression ähm, ähm, und ihre Verbote, also es hat mir viel verboten, ähm, mich auch dadurch sehr beschämt, sodass ich den, in mir den Gedanken entwickelt habe, ich darf gar keine Bedürfnisse haben. A huge part of the progress that I believe I've been able to make has been in cultivating true relationships in the first instance with um, people around me. Was mir bei Wüstenstrom geholfen hat, ähm, war zuerst mal, ähm, dass ich, dass jemand da war, der mich versteht, ähm, der auch selber mit dem Thema schon, ähm, oder selber schon homosexuelle, oder selber homosexuelle Gefühle hat und ähm, ähm, selber auf dem Weg ist und ähm, der mich erstmal angenommen hat, mit dem ich erstmal reden konnte. Was mir auch geholfen hat, war, auch geholfen hat, war dass ich ähm, verstehen konnte, warum ich denn so viel Angst vor anderen Menschen habe. Also warum ich mich schäme, ähm, ähm, in, einer, in einer Gruppe zu sein, vor allem in einer Gruppe von anderen Jungs. Und die körperliche Beschämung hat dann mit acht Jahren zwar aufgehört, aber in mir hat sich diese Beschämung verfestigt. Und, ähm, als ich dann in die Pubertät kam, mit 13, 14, habe ich dann angefangen, andere Jungs anzuschauen und ähm, ähm, mir vorzustellen, ähm, wenn ich diesen Körper hätte, dann müsste ich mich nicht mehr schämen. Und das hat sich dann weiterentwickelt mit 17, ja, mit 17 18, 19, dass ich dann eben auch sexuelle Kontakte, entweder Pornografie oder 
sexuelle Kontakte gesucht habe und auch eine, ein paar Monate einen Freund hatte und da eigentlich auch mir immer nur die Nähe zu dem gewünscht habe oder zu den anderen Jungs, weil ich mir, ja, weil ich mir wie ich heute weiß, vorgestellt habe, dass ich, ähm, wenn ich denen nahe bin, dann kann ich für einen kurzen Moment meine Beschämung vergessen. Also heute weiß ich eben das, ähm, was ich von anderen Jungs da eigentlich suche. Ähm, deswegen möchte ich auch keine homosexuelle Beziehung, ähm, sondern eben ähm, ich su suche den authentischen Kontakt mit anderen Männern, denen ich dann sagen kann, wie es mir wirklich geht und was ich wirklich von ihnen will. Mein Name ist John Greaves. Um, I grew up in England and uh, I've been a teacher for the last few years. So the story of my life, um, I was brought up in a happy family, um, mother, father, three siblings, and um, the only difficult side was my relationship with my father. Um, the relationship with my mother was very good and then probably became too good. I see now that I, I identified greatly with my mother and could never work out how to connect with my father. Um, so when I came to puberty, uh, when I became a teenager, um, when sexuality started, it never developed in the standard way. So I had same-sex attraction from a very early age. And, and looking back again, I see, I think that is, I was, you know, I was trying to connect with my father and never did. And this led me off in the wrong direction. So when I became a Christian, I, I already knew, you know, that what I was feeling in my emotions and my sexuality was not what God was saying. That God had a, had a plan for men and women, uh, for a man and one woman to have a sexual relationship. And what I was feeling didn't fit with that, so I had this problem. Um, so in my 20s I shared with various people, had various input, uh, supportive input from friends, um, but still felt the same and didn't know how to connect with a girl. When I got to 28, one of my friends said, um, could you believe for a point in the future where you could be married? And um, the Lord clearly gave me faith at that point. Uh, and I prayed about it and I thought, yeah, I could, I could think like in two years time, I could get married. Um, and it was about two or three years later that I met my wife, Lindsay, my to-be wife. I was immediately attracted to her, and this was quite a new experience. And it wasn't long before we, you know, talking, we uh, shared and discovered that we both had same-sex attraction. And, and of course, that was amazing plan of the Lord, that we could understand each other and pray for each other and support each other. Um, so about a year later, we got married. Um, you know, very much in love, got married. And this was all a new experience. Um, that didn't mean that all my same-sex attraction had disappeared, but we were still able to support each other, pray through things. Um, we brought up five children. We've been very happily married for 27 years now. Marriage, to me, is a God-given completeness. It's a security, it's a, a Uh, friendship, deep friendship for us, it's a very deep friendship and security, a steady place, a stable place um, whereby we can work out our relationship with God and with our children. What I'd add to that is that um, marriage is an amazing, amazing privilege. I mean it's the building block God has given I believe for life, uh, for, for men and women, for life on earth. Um, but also, of course, at the end of time will be the marriage feast of the Lamb. And, and really we have this great privilege of entering into a shadow of that and a taste of what, how that's going to be uh, in, in human marriage now. Jeg heter Øyvind Svensson, er 60 år og kommer fra Oslo. Selv om jeg kjenner at jeg ikke har nådd målet og er der at jeg tør å gifte meg, med en kvinne i dag, så, så kjenner jeg at uh, denne veien ønsker jeg å gå videre. With hindsight, when you look back at all that you have experienced, do you have any insight into why things went in this direction for you? Jeg fant ut at uh, mitt forhold til min far 
ikke var preget av noe nærhet og av den bekreftelse jeg, som jeg trengte fra en mannsfigur. Jeg følte at det var aldri bra nok det jeg gjorde, og far var rask med å si fra eh, om det var noe negativt, men han bekreftet meg aldri eh, positiv som jeg kan huske som en gutt og som en ung mann. Critics of people who leave homosexuality say that we stereotype this absent father, domineering mother, which is what you've just said. What is your response to that? Min måte å respondere på det er at uh, i mitt tilfelle så, så stemmer det. Men jeg ser jo at det er flere faktorer også etter hvert som min vandring har fortsatt. Den hjelp jeg hadde var å begynne å forstå eh, hvor disse vanskelige følelsene kunne ha sine røtter, som jeg allerede var inne på, eh, særlig i forhold til min egen far. Og så fortsatte jeg med å gå i terapi og, og få jobbe litt mer med akkurat den relasjonen. Det jeg gjorde i forhold til far var å tørre å si sannheten. Tørre å kjenne på at selv om far gjorde så godt han kunne, så var det ikke bra nok. Det jeg vil si til de som ønsker hjelp er at det er verdt å gå en annen vei enn det som er the mainstream i dag. John, you've been on a journey for some years now. Can you tell us briefly something about that story? Yes. When I was young, I coveted the female body. I wanted to be female. I wanted to look like a woman. I wanted to feel like a woman. And that was expressed a few times in my childhood. As I got older and I reached my teenage years, I experienced a lot of... Um, expressions of men looking at me and telling me that I wasn't a man, that I wasn't masculine enough, that I didn't look like a man, that I didn't have the broad shoulders. This carried on into my adulthood and the frustration of feeling not like a man really led me down a strange path. That path was I realized that I was miserable as a man and if I lived as a woman perhaps things would change. And so I decided to become a pre-op transsexual woman. I was born a boy and I lived as a woman for a number of years. What happened was I had a friend who was also a transsexual woman and the day before her sexual reassignment surgery she had a breakdown and realized that she wanted to be a man. When I heard that story I was beginning to look at my own life. Before I even heard about my friend who changed her gender back to being male I was constantly praying to God and saying I don't know what to do. I'm doing what I think is right, but I have no idea if it is right for me. And so when I heard the story about my friend transitioning back to being male, I began to look at my own life and I realized that it wasn't for me. I couldn't do it anymore. There, I, I felt like an empty man. It had nothing to do with being a woman. It had everything to do with the fact that I didn't feel masculine. And when I realized that, I realized that going down the path of becoming a female in society wasn't right for me. Menschen, die in dem Bereich Hilfe suchen, werden sehr schwer haben, echte Hilfe zu finden. Zum einen ist es so, dass es die eine Seite gibt, die einem sagt, es ist halt so, akzeptier's, ähm, du bist so geboren, du bist so geschaffen, lebe das einfach. Und auf der anderen Seite gibt es Menschen, die einem sagen, ja, ich kann dir helfen, diese homosexuellen Gefühle zu unterdrücken, sie wegzumachen. Es gibt im christlichen Bereich auch Menschen, die einem sagen, ich kann dir helfen durch Freibeten, da wird es dann alles gelöst. Oder die einfach überhaupt nicht verstehen, um was es eigentlich gehen, sondern sagen, das ist Sünde, du hast sie erkannt, lass es halt. Aber wirkliche Hilfe wo jemand mit Rat und Tat tatsächlich da ist, er einen annimmt und zuhört und ernst nimmt, wo die Schwierigkeiten und Probleme sind 
und er sieht, dass es eben nicht so einfach ist, das gibt es kaum. Und die werden auch mit aller Gewalt totgeschwiegen, sowohl von der Kirche wie von der Politik. Ich versuche das einfach mal so zu beschreiben, wenn ein Mann, der sich von einem anderen Mann abgelehnt fühlt, wenn der einen Raum betritt, dann erwartet er eigentlich von dem anderen Mann eine Zurückweisung. Und in dieser Zurückweisung und in dieser Erwartung erlebt er Angst und Stress. Und gleichzeitig empfindet er sich selber als minderwertig oder denkt sich, er kann sich gegenüber diesem Mann nicht behaupten. Und das wird dann in der Therapie bearbeitet. Ich bin Pascal Müller und bin 23 Jahre alt. Mein Name ist Stefan Schmidt. Ich arbeite jetzt seit elfeinhalb Jahren in einer Beratungsstelle, in einer christlichen Beratungsstelle in der Nähe von Stuttgart. Dort ähm, beraten wir besonders Menschen, die mit ihrer Sexualität, mit ihrer Identität als Mann oder Frau ringen, ähm, Probleme haben und Hilfe suchen. Wenn ein Mann sich zurückgewiesen fühlt von einem anderen Mann, ähm, dann erfüllt meistens die Sexualität die Rolle eines inneren Theaters. In diesem inneren Theater kann dann dieser Mann, der sich erstmal zurückgewiesen und minderwertig fühlt, auf einmal eine bedeutsame Rolle spielen, indem zum Beispiel der andere dann ein großer Freund ist, der mich umarmt und der mir Mannsein verleiht oder indem ich mich vielleicht sogar in die in den Körper eines ganz anderen Mannes verwandeln kann und so eine bessere Männlichkeit bekommen kann. Für mich war es in erster Linie, würde ich sagen, ein Problem, weil ich selber gemerkt habe, irgendwas ist in mir unstimmig. Ähm, wenn ich mich in einem Moment von einem Junge angezogen gefühlt habe, dann habe ich gemerkt, dass das kein Friede oder eine Ruhe ist, sondern da hat irgendwas dahinter gesteckt. Ich habe am Anfang nicht aktiv nach Hilfe gesucht für das, was ich als Problem empfunden habe, sondern habe mich damit versteckt. Was dann passiert ist, war, dass ich Freunde hatte, die wie Väter für mich waren. Die wussten zwar nicht von meinem Problem, aber sie haben mir doch viel Anerkennung und Bestätigung gegeben. Da wusste ich, da gehöre ich dazu. Und da war nicht die ganze Zeit die Frage präsent, gehöre ich hier dazu oder nicht? Akzeptieren die mich? The key elements of reparative therapy is that a trauma occurred in which the boy feels inferior, not worthy of being connected to men that came from father or brother or peers. As a result, he desires to be close to men, but he's afraid to be close to men. And that tension is resolved in fantasy through sex. That's the, that's the theory. So I would just listen to these men and try to be supportive, but I began to hear a pattern. And the pattern was um, a deep resentment toward their mother Even though they were very close to their mothers, their mothers drove them crazy, frustrated them. And that they had, and that they had a deep disappointment in their father who showed no particular interest in them. Then on top of that, there was bullying an older brother who was, uh, as Freud said, if a homosexual has an older brother, it's a feared, hostile relationship. Again, I've never seen an exception to that. Und in diesem inneren Theater spielt von daher die Sexualität eine ganz große Rolle. Können wir jetzt aber die Beziehungen auf der ähm, realen Ebene, in der Wirklichkeit verändern, sodass, wenn ein Mann ein Mann begegnet, er sich wirklich angenommen fühlt und auch Annahme mit dem leben kann, dann verändert sich automatisch auch der Inhalt seiner Sexualität. Und das, das Konzept, das dahinter steckt, ist eigentlich das Konzept des Kontaktes, des psychologischen Kontaktes. Das heißt, wenn Menschen nicht glauben, dass sie eine eigene Identität haben, dann leben sie entweder mit anderen Menschen verstrickt, das heißt, sie erwarten etwas von anderen, was sie ihnen geben müssen, 
oder ähm, sie müssen sich in deren Gegenwart auflösen und wollen von daher jemand haben, der sie rettet. Und dieses Konzept verändern wir, indem wir den Männern beibringen, dass sie sagen können, äh, ich habe ein Mannsein für mich, ich kann das mit anderen teilen und leben und daher kann ich ganz bei mir bleiben und in mir auch zur Ruhe kommen. Und dann entfällt sozusagen auch dieser innere traumatische Inhalt, der die Sexualität äh, antreibt. A big part of the therapy is encourage our clients to make connection, emotional connection with straight men. And they're afraid to do so. And that should tell you right there that there's something wrong with the gay psychology because they're afraid of men. Paradoxically, they're attracted to them, but afraid, to, afraid of them. And so a lot of the therapy is teaching them to overcome their anticipatory shame so that they can make an emotional bonding with men. Going to a gym, finding a male mentor, using your therapeutic relationship, whatever. Jetzt ist mein Ziel, nachdem ich mich mit den Männern verbunden fühle und auch weiß, dass ich ein Mann bin, dass ich mir darin noch sicherer werde und dass ich die Frage auch, wenn sie auftaucht, immer wieder bestätigen, bestätigt bekomme und dass ich diese Bestätigung bei anderen Männern, wenn ich sie brauche, auch mir hole und nicht durch irgendwelche alternativen Wege suche sondern wirklich auf die Leute zugehe und meine Frage stelle, wo ich weiß, diesen Leuten kann ich vertrauen. Ich denke, was sehr typisch ist für Menschen, jetzt speziell ähm, für Männer, ähm, mit denen ich am meisten arbeite, die ähm, mit homosexuellen Gefühlen zu tun haben, ähm, also was ein typisches Merkmal ist, ist, dass sie Schwierigkeiten haben, Gefühle authentisch gut wahrzunehmen, Gefühle authentisch auch auszudrücken und in Beziehungen ähm, so zu leben und sich selbst so in Beziehungen einzubringen, dass sie tatsächlich ähm, eine Bindung erleben, dass sie tatsächlich erleben, dass Gefühle verarbeitet werden können, dass sie sich geliebt fühlen können, dass sie andere auch lieben können. Ähm, also viele beschreiben das auch bei sich tatsächlich als ganz große Schwierigkeit. Ich heiße Timo. Und ich bin jetzt seit einiger Zeit unterwegs, äh, um meine Identität besser zu verstehen, meine Männlichkeit besser zu verstehen, mich zu verstehen. Ja, und da arbeite ich seit einiger Zeit an mir. Ähm, dieser Prozess, den ich gestartet habe, äh, ging für mich los, dass ich ähm, mir Hilfe gesucht habe, ähm, weil ich mit homosexuellen Gefühlen zu kämpfen hatte und das lange verdrängt habe und nur in mir selber ausgemacht habe. Ähm, diese Gefühle konnte ich nicht einsortieren, wusste nicht, wer bin ich, was macht es mit mir, ähm, was will ich, äh, was ist meine Sexualität, meine Männlichkeit. Wenn Männer zu uns kommen, dann fragen wir sie sehr deutlich und klar, ob sie sich auch andere, zum Beispiel affirmative Therapieformen angeschaut haben. Ähm, dann fragen wir sie auch ganz klar, ob ihre Homosexualität für sie tatsächlich einen Konflikt darstellt. Und wir erklären ihnen auch dann, dass wir nur das in der Therapie behandeln können, was diese Männer selber als Konflikt im Laufe des Gesprächs in sich entdecken. Wir verhindern auf diese Weise, dass der Mann sich irgendein Problem anliest oder dass wir ihm ein Problem reinreden. Wir wollen, dass er das tatsächlich selber entdeckt, entwickelt und dann sagt, hier habe ich einen Konflikt und den möchte ich bearbeiten. Auch wenn manche Leute das sagen, dass Homosexualität in Ordnung ist, erlebe ich oder spüre das in mir nicht so. Ich erlebe es als einen Konflikt. Ich kann für mich selber nicht damit umgehen ähm, und merke das mehr und mehr, dass es auch außerhalb von der Homosexualität in vielen Bereichen genau diese Fragen sind, ähm, bin das ich? Darf ich so sein? Ähm, das ist mein Grundproblem, dass ich oft nicht weiß, wer bin ich oder wie habe ich zu sein. Ich habe in meinem Prozess durchaus das Gefühl, dass ich ähm, sehr viel erreicht habe. Ich bin selbstsicherer. Ähm, ich habe Beziehungen aufgebaut, in denen ich Halt finde, in denen ich Sicherheit finde, ähm, die mir gut tun, wo ich mehr und mehr lerne. Ähm, 
mich äh, wahrzunehmen als ganzen Menschen mit Stärken und Schwächen. Ja, man wirft uns oft vor, dass wir von einer Wertung ausgehen und von vornherein sagen, ähm, Homosexualität ist etwas, das man nicht leben soll oder nicht leben darf und dass wir Menschen dazu zwingen, dazu überreden, ihrer sexuellen Orientierung zu arbeiten. Und ähm, das ist natürlich überhaupt nicht weder meine Haltung noch die Haltung der Menschen, mit denen ich zusammenarbeite, sondern ähm, wir achten sehr genau darauf, dass Menschen sehr und wirklich unabhängig von sich heraus entscheiden können, oder immer die, ja, diejenigen sind, die alleine entscheiden, was sie tatsächlich in ihrem Leben verändern wollen und was sie arbeiten wollen. I see firsthand men, uh, let's say their homosexual feelings are based on a severe case of gender identity inferiority and they project that need outward and are uh, only seeing the beauty and wholeness of maleness in another man's body that becomes eroticized. When that shame-based statement about them that at first says they're worthless as men, uh, are uh, they're, they're, they're stuck and they will always be stuck, they're worthless, that kind of, those messages. When those messages are relieved, the moment of grief and anger that's authentic, that they've never faced before, that's underneath those homosexual feelings, when that's wiped out of the way over a period of time, there are actually moments in my office where that change automatically happens because we're dealing and feeling with what's really going on underneath the homosexual attractions. And so when they come up out of that grief process, the moment of change happens because when they return to who or what they've been erotically attracted to before, they, they look at and they have a cathartic experience of, of some level, of some type. And, and they say things like, oh, wow, David, I just had one last week. Uh, said to me, this whole, I'm paraphrasing, but this whole, whole manhood thing, this feels a lot better than sex with men. That's an unsolicited, those are unsolicited responses. So those are moments of actual emotional change, not just behavioral change. And let's face it, sexual pleasure is a pretty heavy duty kind of pleasure. And something, I know two things when these men spontaneously describe these uh, cathartic moments of change. First of all, for them, it, it isn't inborn, these issues, and it's changeable. Ich würde sagen, wir helfen Menschen, ähm, sich selbst besser zu verstehen, mit den eigenen Gefühlen, Gedanken, ähm, mit, den eigenen, mit ihrer eigenen Art in Beziehung zu sein, damit besser klarzukommen, das besser zu integrieren, vielleicht auch Vergangenheit, was sie früher erlebt haben, besser zu integrieren. Und dass das dazu führt, dass sie ähm, dieses sexuelle Verlangen zum gleichen Geschlecht tatsächlich weniger bei sich erleben und merken, sie werden sogar offen für das andere Geschlecht, ähm, das sie dann anziehend finden, wenn sie, ja, wenn sie es wirklich wollen, wenn sie wirklich das, ähm, das Ziel haben, dorthin zu kommen. There is a danger, but the Christian Church, in seeking to contribute positively to society as it should, and as the apostles encouraged it to do, capitulates to values that betray the foundation of the Jewish heritage upon which the church is built. History shows us that in its own zeal, the church has sometimes betrayed itself and even persecuted the Jews in a shameless way. So at the end of this journey, this exploration of the conflict between competing ideologies and worldviews where do we now stand as people conscious of our histories and our destiny? I've been the pastor of a church in the Republic for almost 28 years. Og så arbeider jeg i til helhet, som er en paraplyorganisasjon som gir hjelp til mennesker som strever med uønskede homofile følelser. I think the fact that the family now has been redefined, that marriage is not between a man and a woman anymore, but can be two men or two women, I think that will have enormous complications by virtue of the fact that it's legislation. So to oppose that position, which is in conflict with the scriptures, there's, there's, a, there, there's to be a legislative consequence. And how that's going to be worked out in the coming days, I just wonder. I wonder, will, ch will churches be allowed to teach what they understand to be the biblical position? I wonder, will the state 
bring pressure to bear on them to have a wider position. I wonder will schools have to change, even Catholic schools, will, will they have to change their ethos? They may not immediately, but I think over a period of time, I think this will grow and develop and become more dominant and more entrenched in the Irish society. Unlike other great social events in the past, um, it never became an issue of this has to be the dominant position and no other position will be tolerated. Here's the sort of overturn of hundreds and thousands of years of civilization, and it's almost now as if it's a normative experience, when in fact, up until the last few months, it wasn't. And the, and, the, and the energy and dynamo that's driving the yes acceptance uh, is going to make it very difficult, I think, for people who, who, hold, the, who hold the traditional view because the, the traditional view will not be allowed to be countenanced. I don't mind someone holding a view opposite to me for as long as I'm allowed to hold my position. But as it presently stands, my position will not be tolerated. And so the, this new position will be the driving force in Irish society. And I don't think that is democratic, democratic or good for the state or good for, the, or good for society as a whole. Mange forskjellige slags årsaker. Men det nytter å, å, å stå sammen og hjelpe hverandre. Det nytter å bearbeide ens eksistensielle problemer. Og gleden over å hjelpe mennesker som strever eksistensielt, det er en glede jeg har. Ja, det som kan være felles hos de menneskene som jeg har erfart. Det er vel at det er noe i vår bakgrunn, det er noe i våre valg i forhold til våre foreldre, i forhold til et overgrep som kan ha skjedd. Så kan den enkelte ha tatt valg som har preget en på en dårlig måte. Og jeg har også sett at det går an å ta nye valg. Det kan være åndelig, det kan være menneskelig, som kan forandre vår holdning til oss selv og til våre omgivelser og til våre relasjoner. Ja, det går an. It's very dangerous and unhealthy for any subject to be treated from one side only. And yet this is what we find in both the media and academics, is that sexual politics is, only, we only hear about it from its, its pro promoters. Um, all of the scholars that deal with it do so from a uh, standpoint of enthusiastic promotion. The consequences of this are that um, there is a narrowing of permissible opinions uh, and viewpoints on university campuses, uh, that students and, um, get a very uh, narrow view, uh, a view of, um, well, essentially the academic world is promoting a political ideology. Um, it is the job of academic scholars to treat phenomena from a detached, disinterested um, viewpoint, a viewpoint as objective as possible. And yet, there's almost no pretense that this is the case in the academic world. Um, women's studies departments openly promote uh, both feminist and homosexual politics without any apology or attempt to disguise it. And this is not just in the academic world, it's also uh, increasingly happening in the legal world. Uh, it's becoming legally unacceptable to express certain opinions now in the United Kingdom, for example. People are threatened with arrest, people are threatened with civil suits, and in some cases with criminal suits for um, expressing opinions that are critical of uh, either uh, feminist or homosexualist politics. I remember that one man told me that if I had my coming out, I would support my family. But because I decided to change for a way of changing, I didn't support my family. That is what we are experiencing today, in the communities, that people who are looking for a way of changing, have very little support from their social environment. Ideologies around sexuality change as culture changes and moves on. Just as we've seen religion politicized and we've seen race politicized, so we are now seeing sexuality being politicized. What we're beginning to see now is the rise of the transsexual agenda 
and the transsexual agenda really is the next step towards pansexuality. And the ironic thing is, surely, that the Romans knew all about pansexuality and had invested in those values. So here we are in the 21st century returning to something that the Romans were very familiar with 2,000 years ago. And so what of the Christian Church? What is the responsibility of pastors and teachers who clearly have an essential role in maintaining time-honored truth about the divine plan and template for human sexuality. Pastors are increasingly intimidated from speaking out um, against um, sexual politics. They do not criticize, the, for many years they've re refused to criticize the feminist agenda. Uh, some have spoken out against the homosexual agenda, such as same-sex marriage, but even that is beginning to, um, to, be, to become more and more silenced. It's getting to the point now where pastors uh, don't even criticize um, fornication, adultery, um, uh, divorce. Um, these are no-go zones for many pastors. Uh, and when, they, when the pastors don't lead, when the pastors are not the, the leadership of the, of the church or the community, then um, it's hard for anyone else to do so. So I think the church's, uh, um, I think the ch ch church's timidity in this is something that is very, very worrying. I think Christians shouldn't be nervous. I think we have a gospel that will bear up to scrutiny. I think we have a savior that sinners will find attractive. I think the fact that we're all broken and we need a savior tells us that we're without hope unless he comes. And whether you're straight or otherwise, our sin is always offensive to God. If we live in sin, we cannot go to heaven. But there is a remedy. The wonder of Christ coming in a man at this time of the year we celebrate his coming. And he came so that we could be saved. Saved from ourselves, but saved from the wrath to come. And so that gospel goes right across the board for all people everywhere, no matter what their sexuality is. Yes, I was saying to a man this morning, in fact, uh, who said to me, a complete stranger I met, and he said that he had lost his faith. So I said, well, you know, what you're talking about is a very serious business because it's not just faith that you've lost, but a, a way of looking at the world, a way of looking at the human condition. How are you now making sense of the world and of yourself? So we need the Christian faith uh, for ourselves to make sense of our own life, of course, but also of the world, of society. Where are we going to start if we don't have any moral or spiritual tradition that is acknowledged? If we have no um, uh, vantage point, as it were, then we will not be able to make the right decisions. We've reflected on the emergence of Judeo-Christian values on European soil and the influence this has had on Western civilization in the Americas and wherever it is found. We've heard the gentle voices of those who wish to leave homosexual practices and who do so for their own purposes and sake of conscience. We've listened to those who support their journey and fight for their rights and freedoms to live life as they see fit. Finally then, it is time to say that those ideologies that force men, women and children to accept a reality they do not wish to own are damaging and hurtful. It is time to respect difference and to accommodate these individuals who choose as a matter of conscience, belief and free will not to embrace dogmas of sexuality that will surely pass.